So uh, thank you all for coming. Maybe some more people jump in because uh, they're doing a farewell of Fran, uh, our, one of our children's teachers. Uh, thank you all for being here. As you know, we do this as a uh, as a as a, uh, as a way of raising money for our homeless uh, ministry. We feed and clothe about 200 homeless people every Tuesday on the outside of the gate. Uh, we've got great volunteers who come in. Of course, that takes money, so Kathy's bringing in a basket. I don't know if you've seen, seen our office, but our office is under major construction, so <laughs> we're trying to find a basket right now. But at the end of the uh, talk back, there'll be a basket on our table in the back. And if you could, uh, please take a little bit of my contribution. Please welcome uh, the fabulous person, Green. We have been doing these talk backs. We've been talking about makers. We had, we've had actors, we've had uh, writers, uh, and uh, very excited to have some money from the production producing side of things because they have a lot of inspiring producers as well. Uh, let's get started from the very beginning. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, where the film takes place. And uh, I grew up within a mile of Kate and Jackson Stockton. Our families have known each other all our lives, um, but I went to rival schools, so, <laughs> so um, I didn't go to school with them. But, um, and and Tate is Tate Taylor, who, oh, uh, who wrote, the wrote the script and wrote the film. Brilliant. Um, so when you were growing up as a, as a little child, did you want to be a movie? Did you want to be a film producer? No. Well. I had 
one job offer that uh, it's not attractive to Houston and they want to go to Houston. So a, a fraternity brother of mine had a free place to stay in Austin and um, this Bill Whitliff who did once the road once the government produced it, this amazing guy, he was doing a Western TV series called Death Blessing that was in CBS and acting as a lawyer as the president of the internal after a few months. And then never had to look for a job after that because you go to a job, you hear about other jobs. And the, and the weird thing is that Julius Tennant was, on, was an actor in that movie on the first movie I worked on. It was uh, Bauer Davis. Huh. Uh, 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 Ten years later, and he, walks up on, he walks on the set of you know, Mississippi and Julius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you stayed in Texas and you were doing a lot of were you staying in Texas for the was this? Uh, no, I, would, I got I was based out of Austin, but that was I would be plucked. Ah, so like oh, my second job was in Mississippi on a guy named Bailey's handbag where I was in casting and then working back next to the computers. It was kind of I was a vagabond um, you know, freelancer based out of Austin. Then I started doing a little bit of TV movies in LA and um of Innocence with Valerie Bird. And so were these all extras casting? No, it was, uh, I started at Dutch Road. And then, um, 18, uh, nine, I was like a non-union 18, but it was kind of like an 18 on the cheap. Like, a lot of times they get credit for it, but just, right. um, I worked under a line for sort of this So that's how I learned production. And then, um, but I liked Austin, so I stayed there. And I had a bunch of, like, Rock and I had a bunch of Empire. J. Duke Washington, the multiple guys on the film, they did um, uh, Cyrus. And but when they just did uh, they, uh, a safety. Oh, uh, there's not a guarantee. Great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Those guys were literally like, down the hall from me. And, you know, sort of, you know, and, and you were starting to do your thing with tapes, right? Mm -hmm. Starting yeah. doing independent with tapes. So, <laughs> so you leave, you're doing production, you're in college. Uh, when did you guys meet up and do your first? Did a short well, the weird thing, yeah. Well, the weird thing is, <laughs> I was I went to Europe to do a movie, a nuclear power plant. Uh, it was like an action movie that John Dahl was directing, and then the movie got canceled because two different producers sold the movie to two different companies. <laughs> and one Aramax had it, and so there was a company. There was a lawsuit, and so I had to be in Europe, and uh, then all of a sudden I had no job. So uh, I was like, oh, screw it, I'll go to Spain for. Um, Spanish, I always want to learn Spanish, I spent some time there. I come back to Mississippi with no job, no house, and Tate was in Jackson building houses, and we had a bunch of mutual friends, and so my friends like, oh, well, Tate is interested in film, you should talk to him and, you know, give us some advice. And so we went to the Mega Records Blues concert, and met there, um, it was like a huge festival. And uh, I was like, oh, well, there's this movie called The Tiger Jingle. It's coming to town. You should just go in there, knock on, you know, walk in the door and tell them you want to be a PA. Because they'll hire you, you know, you're, you're smart, you're good looking. Just, just go in there and just, just act like you're in the place. Which he does anyway, naturally. I didn't know him. So that's <laughs> naturally how it is. And so he got a job in there. <laughs> that, that grant on that movie and Octavia Spencer. And so then Octavia and Tate drove. Uh, to LA together, and I had just moved there, and so they take out with the face. And of course, Octavia Spencer played many in the film when we had the award. Yeah. Uh, for the role. Yeah, so um, we've been here for 18 years. Wow. Was it 18 years ago? Yeah. 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 Mary, Mary was two. Yeah. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but you guys, so you did your short, and then you, you traveled around with it. Yeah, I mean, we cut, I, Tate and I ended up cutting, the, the, I mean, we shot it, it was like a three-year process, it was like, it would take time to go to school, kind of. Yeah. Because he wrote it, started it, and directed it, and it did, we won like 12 festivals, it did like 35 festivals, it was just, that was a job into itself, but we were trying to kind of promote Tate as a filmmaker, um, and then we did the kind of dog the funny show, which 
trying to get this kind of quirky movies done, and we got one of them more for the other people, which Octavia's, which is in Melissa McCarthy, who's in Chicken Party, and Missy Pyle, uh, yeah, and um, House of Jane, and yeah. Josh Hartman. So all people that we've used before. Yeah. And uh, it, did, it did okay, but that was once again a three year process of creating film. I had to edit it and the special effects and everything. You gotta check it out. It's called Pretty Ugly People. It's a, it's a Netflix stream. Yeah, it's a great little film. It's, it's a sweet little comedy that's that, that's about friends and, and about this woman who uh, was overweight uh, when she was younger and that's trying to reconnect with her friends. Uh, and it, what was the budget on that? That was like just under a million dollars. Just over a million. Yeah. And so then.
so charming and intelligent. Um, you know, you, you kind of know that he, he's in control and he likes to be in control. So when we came in to meet with the studio for the first time, it was, you know, uh, the head of the studio station started being brilliant. And Steve Spielberg and the rest of the team. And it's like, well, okay, maybe that part's already taken. It's going to be Octavius and Tim Curry. And Allison Jane is going to play uh, Skeeter's mom. And they, they said, okay, they said, great. And of course, they, you know, knocked out the part of the They were really kind of, you know, normally they'd say, no, we need whoever. Yeah. They, were, they, they, they knew that this book was so special that it didn't have to be cast by movie stars. Cast for the right, actors for the right roles. And so, um, our cast director was my first real boss in the film, which was uh, Carrie Barton, who really did well. Every week, a film cast is, is amazing. And he's great at um, picking out discoveries. Now, when you guys started shooting, was this yeah. Jessica Chastain played? Yeah, Jessica. Uh, uh, Sue Celia. And, Celia. And Jessica, she came in, and she was shooting a movie in like Texas, or no, Louisiana. And she flew in specifically to audition, and we had never heard of her before. And our cast director had cast her in the movie she was in, but she came with the project, so he never even met her, and he wanted to meet her. So it's like, I heard this, baby, this girl's amazing, you gotta bring her in, and we're gonna bring her in for Sylvia. I just have a feeling she's gonna knock her out of the park. And so she walks in, and she looks nothing like she does in the movie. Red hair, like really slender, kind of kind of bookish. And as soon as she walked in, I was like, yeah, it's literally not gonna work. It's not gonna work. And then Octavia was there reading actresses for us, which is really sweet. She did a lot of the reading for, um, as many for all the series. So we saw probably 150 people for Celia. And so she walked in, and there were five of us in the room. And after the first scene, we were just kind of captivated by her. She, she just transformed, even though she looked the same. Like some actresses have that amazing ability. And then after the second scene she did, we were all crying, including <laughs> Jessica and Octavia. <laughs> <laughs>
chess game, it's just a fascinating story. And um, what happened was essentially Ruth was pregnant and had to stay in Bushan land while he was fighting for his crown in England. So she was alone, but the, the whole tribe kind of like embraced her and made it. They called her like their mother. And when she, the first time she was kind of um, presented to all the people in the, in the country, uh, they have like 2,000 women bringing um, food and gifts in a, in a whole line, and she, she greeted them all. And it's this amazing picture that Margaret or White, the, the life photographer, took. And there's these thousand women, and it ran, and it was a drought, and it started raining. Um, as soon as she, like, the, the, as soon as she, she started the procession. So oh it's kind of like, uh, and so what happened was they, um, even though nobody wanted them to stay together, um, they ended up, he gave up his throne, and ended up kind of doing a, a really crafty deal where they couldn't uh, mine for diamonds unless they were in any kind of democracy. And then you, and so they ran, he ran for president and won the presidency. And 100% literacy, uh, it's just like a real success story of Africa. And their, their son is now president. Uh, uh, the is this the next project that you guys are doing, or what did you develop? No, we, um, we're developing with a company called Pathé, it's a European mm -hmm. um, distributor. And so we just hired a writer for that. So that one's down the road, but I don't know why we're here. <laughs> 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 I, I just love the story. It's yeah. So, on and off. So, you guys you can go from DreamWorks, you're ready to go. You guys show what did you shoot? We shot in Mississippi, and they didn't necessarily want us to shoot there. They wanted us to shoot in Georgia or Louisiana because they were sub southern and uh, incentives. But Mississippi has great incentives. They just don't have a crew. Right. And so before we even had a studio, um, Tate, a production designer, Sony, our producer, and I went down and scouted. And we we found the city of Greenwood as that's like the perfect place to be in Jackson, 1960s. So we took photos of all the locations that we wanted to shoot in, and then created a lookbook. So literally, Skeeter's house, we already had it. It's like, this is where it is. It's three blocks from Haley's house. And so like, you could really say, like, this is where we could shoot 90% of our And the state of the city was phenomenal. They um, literally bent over backwards to have a shoot there. They, the last real major film was the Christians, right? I mean, so uh, it was fantastic. The city, the Greenwood's an amazing city. It's great. It's a tiny town, 2,000 people. I mean, they let us do it. So, so uh, Emma Stone, uh, casting with Skeeter. How how did that? How many Skeeters did you read? Uh, uh, we actually didn't read any Skeeters. What happened with that was. Um, we had a hunch Emma was who we wanted, even though nobody knew she, who she was. And there were no copies of movies for her, I mean, to show tape. So I I went on the internet and I downloaded a, an illegal version of Zombieland. So <laughs> it was like a year, it was like filmed in some, it right, right. you know, and showed him, like, this is the girl that you know, I want you to be with. And Carrie Barden, our cast director, is the one who's like, she's going to be. She's like really good. She's got, you know, I know there's no footage of her, but she's really good. And so Tate met with her and loved her. She said she felt like she was like a Joan Cusack, a younger Joan Cusack, so really funny or really likable. And that was pretty easy, eh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But well, we got to see an early cut of ECA. Then once she was in the running, it's really cool that in the studio was like, oh, yeah, there's, you know, this movie's not going to be out for six months, but here, you can check it out. Um, so then we got to see all of her. She's, she's, I mean, she's very strange. She's, yeah. She's, 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 uh, her, her full talents haven't been explored yet. Yeah. So the movie's done, it comes out, it becomes this kind of sleeper hit. Did you guys expect, did you ever imagine, was there ever a moment in time like you're on the set, like when you first read the manuscript, like, yeah, this is going to be nominated for an Academy Award? No, not, not awards, but I am, I, I thought it was close to at that, by that, that time, the book was number one, and we had done a lot of kind of book club discussions, and 
you know, so we kind of knew the, the um, passion behind the book. We've got a lot of people all over the country now. So we knew that they were going to give friends and not, and that's the word. So we just couldn't screw it up. Yeah. We make it halfway decent that people, you know, go see the movie. So what? So what is it? What are you? Um, uh, I can't announce it for another three weeks, but no, an actress from the Help and I are working. We're going to hopefully shoot something at the beginning of January. Great. So, uh, it's a great historical epic. It's a phenomenal story. Is that Tate directing, or is this? No, Tate's not directing. It's a, a British director. It's a British story. It's a, it's a, Tate is currently rewriting a, a screenplay for Fox. He's got like three projects. Three projects. <laughs> is there a historical figure or a book or something that you would like to rethink? Somebody can say, what's your dream project right now? What would it be? What have you always wanted to do? Um, uh, well, there's a project that, uh, it's the story of Tesla. I don't know if you know what yeah. it is. It's a, a, a book that I've optioned. That's, um, it's, it's a historical novel. It's, it, I just actually, this morning, I was reading the rewrite. Right? It's really, it can be something really special. Because right? people don't realize that Tesla, Edison, um, basically always stole people's intellectual property. So he was kind of a jerk. <laughs> and, um, and Tesla was like a very idealistic guy. He developed a system that would be given free electricity all over the world mm. using the ionosphere. Mm. And uh, the robber barons of the 20s kind of uh, figured out a way to make sure that didn't happen. So, mm. so it's the story of, of how he really did change our lives because these fans, the reason these fans work is because of Tesla. An alternate oh, yeah. and alternate uh, and but he doesn't get any credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> Last question for me, and I'll ask that question. If you had one piece of advice to give to someone who gets up the bus and wants to, wants to make it on with you, whether it be a, a writer or Turn right back around. <laughs> Right, from the Crisco to the, I mean, 
really wanted to preserve the authenticity that Kathleen had put into the book because we're all from Jackson. And um, so, like an example, in the grocery store scene on a, the Jitney Jungle, I had to try, like, the, the people that used to own Jitney Jungle were family friends of ours, but trying to track down who owns the name of Jitney Jungle now is. <laughs> And people were like, why do you care? It's like, because it's Jimmy Jungle, it's a book. It's real. We used to go there. And, Br and Briggs Drugs is an example of uh, that was where we used to go get our milkshakes and grilled cheeses. And it was a, and we during our initial scout before we had a studio, we went in there and they had just renovated it. Right? <laughs> and, and, but and so I said, can we come back here in about six months and just Make it like it was. <laughs> so they they did that. They had all the old like all the old uh, counters and stuff, and so they brought them back in for us. Oh, and we even paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> and they kept, but they kept some of that charm because after the movie, they kept uh -huh. some of the yeah. movies yeah. and stuff because they're like, yeah, this is better. So, but thanks for noticing. <laughs> I just want to tag to that. I, I saw the movie late at night, and when I was out of the theater, I was craving fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, That's I was the like, only thing you got from the movie. No, yeah. I, 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 my food, my taste buds were craving fried chicken. <laughs> no, I loved the movie. I thought it should have won the Academy Award. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. Jessica. So um, my mother has this old caramel cake recipe that is just—it's so addictive. Like it's that because it's that salty caramel where you can't stop. Right. Um, and so she was. So Viola was doing Vince's on uh, Broadway. Subsequently, she won the Tony that year for it. And so I sent up a couple of my mother's caramel cakes up there, and she gained. She said she gained about twelve pounds. <laughs> Some of these emotional scenes, or any racial 
issues triggering people? Um, How do they deal with the them? scene with when you you may get arrested? Yeah. There, uh, oh. uh, one of the extras who's from Greenwood had seen something similar happen to I think it was to her sister uh, years before, and it, it kind of it really. I mean, that was a really tough emotional day for everybody shooting that scene. I mean, just, um, but I, one thing I, that came to mind about, um, just when I was watching this clip today, that, I mean, this is kind of an off topic, but not really, is where when someone sees something in a movie and it, it, it kind of triggers something, yeah. um, there's the scene where, Uh, she, well, she described it in the sermon where um, uh, Yilmay's asking for money to help get her kids to come to college. And then you see the scene where Abilene talks about her son dying. Well, my next door neighbor from, my next door neighbors who, you know, they've been my neighbors for 25 years. I went back um, for charity screening. We did a, we, we did this, um, we raised money for the community center in the town we shot in. And so uh, all the cats came and we raised $175,000 for that screening. And a lot of us, most DreamWorks paid for it, getting everybody down there, it was great. Um, but what's cool is uh, my next door neighbor, who's a seven-year-old surgeon, you know, doctor, he's from Mississippi. He, uh, this isn't a happy story, by the way, but I think it's something it's really important, I mean, it's yeah. something to show. Um, so he saw the movie was really impacted by it. So then um, he went home, and their housekeeper is a, a housekeeper they've only had for like three or four years because they had a housekeeper for 48 years who passed away. And so this woman, he didn't really know that well, but he, he said, you know, I, I, I got a couple of tickets to help for you. It was, I, I'd like to see what you think about it. And he hadn't really talked to her that much because, you know, he's at work, and, you know, he, he loved his housekeeper. 48 years, and so he hadn't really, there wasn't much of a relationship with her. And she was in her mid-50s, and she came back after seeing the movie, and he said, what did you think? She said, it made me really happy, made me really happy and also really sad. And he said, well, what, what made you happy? And she goes, I'm happy that I wasn't the only person to go through that. And, and he said, what, you know, what, what exactly do you and she said that in 2003, she had a, she worked for an older woman, older white woman in Jackson. And her daughter had, was living in an apartment, was 22 years old, and living um, alone in an apartment in Jackson. And he got her, her income tax refund check and cashed it for that, you know, that day. And then somehow she was, somebody she knew, robbed her and killed her in her apartment. Oh, wow. And she went to her her employer, who's this older woman, and said, Can I borrow some money to bury my child? And and she said, um, that's what your um, that's what your people look for. And you know oh. and so people like kind of say, oh like about Hilly, how oh no people don't really say things like that, but they they do. They do. Yeah, and it's like, this is probably like an eight-year-old woman who has this mindset, which that was probably around Hilly's, what her parent, what her father taught her, whatever. You know how that's, that, that, that mentality sticks. I mean, I, I think, you know, Mississippi's completely changed from that, but still there's that remnant there. But what the positive I got out of that, oh, and also what's interesting is that she said that they never found out who killed her daughter, and so every year on the anniversary of her death, she, she gets an ad to pay her for the reward of her daughter. But so every year she's reminded of, of that, of that, what happened with her boss. You know, it's, um, but the positive I got out of that was that my neighbor would have never had a conversation with me, with his employee, and never, like, never known something so important about one's life. Yeah. And then she felt comfortable enough to share that with a seven-year-old white man who, when she had that experience with that older white woman. You know what I mean? Yes. So yes. 
it's uh, and there's been stories like that that I've heard of people opening up conversation and it just kind of it adds perspective of, of people's lives are also different and you don't know what people have been through and what they've encountered so you can't really judge why they do things. Um, I think it's a good lesson. So. I was born in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey. I was radio announcer working in some big cities in New York and Cincinnati and Baltimore. But when I started out my career, I started in the South. It was a different mentality. And I know your film, and I, I you know, I, I identify the attitudes because they were very strong in those times. And I have an idea, that just from my experience, I'll give it to you gratis, because uh, your film generally deals with racial, racial hatreds and prejudices against women and against women. And when I was down in North Carolina, I worked uh, for a television station in New Bern, which is the coast, and it was like New Bern, Washington, Greenville. And uh, I was just doing you know, sports casting and kiddie shows, and nothing big. But uh, we were very aware at that time of the tensions that existed and what was in control. And like on every uh, Thursday when I drive out to the station, it was a little suburb of the town where the tower was, we passed the Ku Klux Klan meeting. And they were not allowed to burn crosses because it's against North Carolina laws. But they had this big electric cross that they had. But they all had their hoods on and, you know, they were all celebratory and singing hymns for some reason. Uh, I don't think God's too pleased. But uh, you got the idea of who was in charge. And it was very, very tough. And one of the things that brought it home to me because it wasn't an Irish station, but it was like we had ABC, CBS, and NBC, and the three cities. And we were in New Bern, and this town, Washington, was very close. And uh, there was a newscaster, and he said something uh, somewhat editorially about Ku Klux Klan not being the best. And later, he disappeared, and uh, it's sort of swampy land, and they found his body in a swampy area where there was rattlesnakes and he was bitten to death. And everybody knew the Ku Klux Klan did, but the police said, oh, he had a mistake, and the police knew it, and it, it was like open, uh, oh, where the was that? I don't want to give my age away, but a few years ago, uh, but as an idea for a, a film, I thought, I'm just giving it to gratis. I mean, I don't, maybe, it may not be worth anything. No, 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 no. But I'm saying there, the tension on a masculine level, on that racial divide, if you were on either side, and he was a white man that you killed, what was life or death? And it was, uh, and we all understood that, you know. So, it's so there are a few certain, obviously, when you have a book that's that many pages, you can't bring everything to the screen. So, if you could drop it from Sterling, why did you decide what was going to go in and what wasn't? Well, um, Tate uh, did kind of a first pass of the script. Yeah. Uh, and before he did that, he and Catherine met. New York, actually in Central Park, they just put the shepherd's meadow. Uh -huh. um, and he okay. went through, he's like, I want to she's meadow. And he's like, I want to get rid of this. And she's like, well, you can't get rid of that because Hilly has to do this over the wall. So Tate kind of used that guide, that guide is from Catherine, wrote a 195 page screenplay. And then brilliantly, he kind of created some things that got across what happened in the book. Case in point, like, in, in the movie, uh, um, Minnie, like, in the movie, Minnie works for Hilly. But it's like, in the book, it's, she works for Hilly.
with his mom. You know what I mean? Like, he lets so he can yeah. these things, and so you get the gist of the power play, but in a much more efficient way. So, like, the first 300 pages of the book, if you really read, if you look at it, it's really like the first 20 pages of the book. Wow. So, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>